My hope is that quantum computers will help us solve our existential problems. But the journey to get to a useful quantum computer is a difficult one. Even though in theory we think we can achieve this, doing it in practice is a whole different thing. Our latest quantum chip is the most powerful that we've ever made. But it still needs to be thousands of times larger in order to solve all the practical applications that people are excited about. The problem is, as you make it bigger, you get more errors. If you want to program a computer, quantum or non, you need the bits to be able to remember the state you put them in. But the quantum bits that we have today, the qubits, are error-ridden, they're forgetful. Fortunately, there's a scheme known as quantum error correction where we can organize quantum bits in such a way that you can build a bigger, less error-prone system. Quantum error correction holds this promise to be able to make quantum computing scale to these very large systems. But no one's ever been able to make the actual systems themselves good enough that as you scale it up, it reduces the amount of errors that you have. In order to make this experiment work, a lot of things have to work at the same time. The quantum chip, all the qubits, the fridge and the electronics and the cables and everything. And so there's a lot of trial and error that goes into getting all this hardware working together. It just kept cranking over a period of months. And at some point, we thought we could really attempt the experiment fully for the first time. But then when we actually go to run the algorithm, their performance was, <laughs> like, was terrible. The sophistication of the system and what we were trying to do with it were beyond anything that we had ever done before. And so we basically had to develop a new language that we used to make the chip do what we wanted it to do. And that took a lot of hard work from a lot of very smart and dedicated people. How about this? Communicating with the qubits is pretty tricky because we don't want them to interact with the environment on accident, but we do want them to listen to the signal that we're sending to them. That's all this algorithm is, but if, suppose we can suppress this. And it's not just telling the qubits what to do. We also need to get information back from the qubits so that we can ask, what state were you in? At the beginning, even though the errors were pretty high, I felt like, you know, we can grind this out. We can make it happen. There were a lot of people on the team who were figuring out new ways to make the operations better, new ways to make our decoding better. Is there another decoder that can get us there? Maybe. After a few months, it was definitely like weighing on us. Like, oh gee, maybe this isn't actually gonna work. I'd certainly say that resilience is strong on this team. Not everyone has the same approach to solving a particular challenge. When progress slows, you start to worry, you know, will we ever get there? We're pushing on the experiment, we're pushing on it, we're pushing on it, and then finally it just clicks. For the first time we have gone past the break-even point. Even though we went to a larger array of data qubits, the error rate came slightly down. We showed that quantum error correction doesn't only work in theory, but that it actually works in practice. And what that does is it opens the door towards making very large and powerful quantum computers in the future. I am optimistic that equipped with a quantum computer, humans will be able to solve problems that they couldn't otherwise. There is this palpable confidence on our team is that we will be able to complete our roadmap and build a large, useful quantum computer. It's going to happen not too long from now. <laughs>